Welcome to Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. Today we're looking at obesity and how it's been neglected as a key to diagnosing and treating major diseases, including heart failure. It's not an accident that the majority of patients with this type of heart failure have obesity. Obesity is in fact causing it. That realization has not really occurred until now. I couldn't have functioned to the point that I am now without having lost the weight. So it's, it's been tremendous for me. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Nancy Collins. I'm 77 years old. I live in Kansas City, and I have a diagnosis of heart problems. My heart was out of sync, was racing at times, felt like it was slowing down at times, and then it would race again, and it would be a rapid heartbeat. It would just be fluttering for a while, and it kept me from doing anything. It would speed up and slow down and just was irregular. Therefore, the blood flow wasn't good, and that was making me fatigued. I couldn't do the chores that I needed to do. I couldn't function. I had a hard time cooking, cleaning, doing anything around the house, and I just couldn't walk from one room to the other without having to have assistance and sitting down for a while. It was getting to the point where I didn't know what was wrong with me. I continually got more fatigued and more fatigued until finally I couldn't sleep at night. My heart was racing and my husband helped me to the hospital and I went in to emergency care. When I went in, they at first was just trying to get it under control and find out what was wrong with me. They took a couple of days to diagnose that it was AVIP and it was it was out of sync and so they finally decided to shock me. They explained to me that it was a matter of putting paddles on either side of my heart and giving it a rapid electric shock and getting it back in sync again and hoping for the best. It was scary for me because they told me that they didn't know that it would work at first. After I had my heart shocked and it was back in sync again, my heart was increasingly getting better, but my activity level wasn't high as it had been before. I do have a weight problem and they encouraged me to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, of course, less meat, less fatty foods, less fried foods, less fast foods, and to exercise more, which is difficult for me to do. If you have a weight problem, it's very hard to change those lifestyles just because someone tells you to. I weighed 234 and my height is 5'2", which is probably stretching it. I'm probably only 5'1 at this point. If God gave me in height what he gave me in width, I would be very tall. I actually had increased my weight instead of decreasing my weight from the time that I had had my operation until the time that I went back to the doctor. After having my, uh, after being shocked, I still found it was increasingly hard to do the things that I used to do. I felt like my other friends were, were more active than I was, and I was having difficulty keeping up with them. I went routinely to my doctor. He was checking me out. And as he was ready to leave the room, he said, do you have any questions? And I said, yes, my metabolism is, is not good. I don't seem to ever lose weight. It doesn't make any difference if I eat or I don't eat. I just can't lose weight. He said that there was a study that was going to be happening at another hospital close, and he would check into it. I did that afternoon get a telephone call from someone at the other hospital and I drove down because I wanted to be a part of that study and I thought that was my my only hope to be able to lose any weight at all because I'd tried everything else all my life and nothing had happened. 
I was on the study for, I think it lasted for 11 months and I lost 38 pounds. I was very proud of myself. I am more active now. It's easier for me to do the things that I want to do now than it was before. It's much easier for me to walk to the store and be able to, to do the things that I need to do. I live on an acreage. It's 10 acres and I mow my own grass. I just last night finished staining a deck and took me a couple of nights to be able to do it, but I can do it and I feel tired, but I don't feel as fatigued as I did before. The doctors have said that my heart is beating better now. It's more capable of blood flow. And because of that, I have more energy. So it's improving my overall health. I couldn't have functioned to the point that I am now without having lost the weight. So it's, it's been tremendous for me. I think our country needs to realize that we have a huge weight problem and we need help with that. We understand smoking is a problem, alcoholism is a problem. It seems to be that if you're overweight, that's just your fault. We need help in realizing that obesity is an illness too, like all other illnesses, that we need support in that from our doctors with that, and our insurance companies. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. Today, we're talking about the fastest growing type of heart failure in this country, one that has been difficult to treat and has a high mortality rate. We're joined by Dr. Mikhail Kasibarad. He's vice president of research at St. Luke's Health System in Kansas City. Dr. Kasibarad, let's talk about these heart failure patients and what you found. What we've seen recently is that a very large proportion, more than half of all patients that have heart failure, have a particular kind of heart failure, where the pumping function of the heart is actually normal, but patients develop heart failure symptoms such as shortness of breath, exertional intolerance, fatigue, and swelling. And what we have been observing is that most patients, close to 80% or more of patients that have this kind of heart failure, also have overweight or obesity. And Obesity may not just be a comorbidity, meaning a coexisting condition in these patients, but may actually be a root cause of why they develop this type of heart failure to begin with. Why isn't that just a given? As you say, it's not just a comorbidity. What was the thinking? We've been so conditioned as cardiologists to kind of think when we see a patient with heart failure to see and think about the heart being the primary cause of the problem, that it hasn't occurred to us as much as it should have that in fact obesity is a systemic disease that affects multiple organ systems and heart is just one of them and this type of heart failure that i was just talking about we call it heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or half path for short it essentially means you have heart failure syndrome even though the heart function is preserved it hasn't occurred to us that this is actually uh, just one of the manifestations of the systemic disease, which is obesity. You know, it's not an accident that majority of patients with this type of heart failure have obesity. Obesity is, in fact, causing it. That realization has not really occurred until now. You could argue that it should have, but it hasn't. What have we been doing? What has been the belief around what's happening with these patients? Well, I would say as a medical community, we have not really been doing much. You know, the typical medical notes, there would be a statement like, this patient has obesity with a BMI, I just say, of 40, and that complicates all aspects of care. Well, that's nice, but what do you do about that? We have very few uh, efficacious treatments to improve outcomes. Now, of course, you know, I would say the professional societies have acknowledged that lifestyle modifications are important, and I think that's the underlying base for everything we recommend. And so, of course, there have been recommendations about healthy lifestyle modifications. And, of course, until recently, we have not had a lot of very efficacious pharmacologic treatments for weight loss, but now we do. And that's why we did the studies to answer this really critical question, does pharmacologic therapy 
at least with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, does it actually improve heart failure outcomes in population of patients that have a combination of this type of heart failure and obesity. So how have clinicians actually been addressing the growing number of patients with this kind of heart failure? Sometimes I call it window dressing. What we would typically do is concentrate on the downstream effects. For example, congestion would be treated with water medications or water pills, and it would work for a brief period of time, but invariably continue to get worse because we are not addressing the underlying problem, which is obesity. Same would be with things like sleep apnea and atrial fibrillation. We would treat the downstream effects, but not address the root cause. Now, in fairness, Until recently, we didn't have a lot of tools to address the underlying cause. Now we do, and so we could actually do the clinical trials to prove that addressing the underlying cause actually matters. And of course, what we found is that it matters a lot. So what led you to do this study? It was becoming clear to several of us in the community that the prevalence of this type of heart failure has been rising relentlessly at the same time that the prevalence of obesity has been rising relentlessly. There were really good studies demonstrating that obesity and accumulation of fat tissue inside the body and inside the vital organs of the body appear to be the biggest predictor of both the development and progression of this kind of heart failure. The second critical factor was emergence of agents that actually can produce clinically meaningful weight loss. And while we were using these agents, what we were observing is in a number of patients that lost substantial amount of weight, their heart failure symptoms either dramatically improved or completely disappeared. And it was not just in one patient, it was in a whole series of patients that we were observing this. So, you know, we were fortunate, of course, in our ability to definitively test it in a large group of patients. So tell me how it worked, the study, and what you found. What we did was design a large global clinical trial in patients with heart failure, with preserved ejection fraction, half path, and obesity, 529 patients across 96 clinical trial sites in 13 countries. They were randomly assigned to either semaglutide 2.4 milligrams once a week, known under its branded name of Wigovi, or matching placebo. And what happened? What did you find? What we found was quite remarkable, which is patients treated with semaglutide experienced much greater improvement in their heart failure-related symptoms and physical limitations, much greater improvement in exercise function, and much greater reduction in inflammation. And the improvement that we observed was the largest that's ever been seen with any pharmacologic treatment ever in this type of heart failure. You said, well, we measured inflammation, but what else did you see biologically? One is we measured the biomarker of heart failure and was a very substantial reduction in congestion, at least as measured by this biomarker as compared with placebo. So again, it wasn't just the weight loss that made people feel better. The biology of heart failure appeared to be influenced in a positive direction. And we did collect the events of heart failure hospitalizations and urgent visits to the emergency department. And what we found was that there were a total of 13 of those events in the trial. There were very few. Out of 13 of these events, only one occurred in patients treated with semaglutide, and 12 occurred in patients treated with placebo. And the best I can summarize it is to say patients felt a lot better. They had fewer physical limitations. The exercise function substantially improved, the inflammation went down, the markers of congestion went down, and there appear to be fewer clinical events of heart failure in patients treated with semaglutide versus placebo. This may ultimately translate in fewer heart failure hospitalizations and emergency department visits. It doesn't definitively prove it because that was not the focus of the study and there were relatively few of these events, but Without a doubt, that should be further investigated. What do you think is happening here with heart failure when you become obese? So what happens as you gain weight? As uh, you gain fat tissue, adipose tissue, especially fat tissue around you know, visceral organs in the body like heart, kidneys, liver, and so on, the degree of inflammation goes up. And inflammation drives a number of structural changes in the heart 
including fibrosis or scar tissue formation in the heart, which can, of course, make the heart more stiff and increase the degree of congestion. There is also expansion as you gain weight, especially as you gain adipose or fat tissue, there is expansion in blood volume and plasma volume, which, of course, can ultimately lead to congestion as well. And we know that weight gain is intricately related to a risk of worsening hypertension or high blood pressure. And we know that high blood pressure can cause thickening of the heart muscle. But I would say this combination of inflammation, increase in systemic blood pressure or hypertension, expansion of plasma volume and blood volume ultimately leads to symptoms of congestion, which is how we define heart failure. So what should we understand about your study and what needs to happen moving forward in your view? I think the heart of the matter, if you will, is that obesity is present in the majority of patients that have this kind of heart failure. They're very symptomatic. They're very disabled because of their heart failure symptoms. They have high rates of heart failure hospitalizations and high rates of death. And so they have very bad outcomes and we have very little to offer them. And this is the first experimental proof that addressing obesity does something incredibly important for this patient population. We know for certain now that it makes them feel better and be able to do more, and it may actually dramatically impact their prognosis. But I think that second part, we need further investigation to definitively prove that, and I hope that those further trials will be forthcoming. So what are the implications here of all this? I think addressing obesity has implications well beyond just heart failure because it may actually also significantly improve outcomes with other obesity-related complications like liver disease, like type 2 diabetes, like sleep apnea, like atrial fibrillation, like many, many other things that are consequences of obesity. And I think this is the beginning of the complete sea change in how we view obesity, not just as a coexisting condition, that we kind of pay lip service to by doing this window dressing, as I said before, where we just try to manage the downstream effects, but without addressing the root cause. So, you know, it's a sea change because I think it's the beginning of transitioning from that paradigm to a new paradigm, which is in order to address the complications of obesity, you have to treat obesity itself, which is a really, really important change in the conversation from obesity as a coexisting condition to obesity as a root cause of all of these complications and a key target for therapeutic intervention. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Rachel. It was a real pleasure to be with you. That's Dr. Mikhail Kasibarad. He's Vice President of Research at St. Luke's Health System in Kansas City. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. Next time, narcolepsy. It's much more than a sleep disorder. I started to get sleepy during class and I would go to the bathroom to wake myself up. I was having trouble driving just even 15 minutes to school in the morning. There was one morning I woke up in the law school parking lot and I didn't remember getting there. And that really scared me. So that's when I thought maybe there's something wrong with my sleep. It was the morning. Like, this is the time you should be most awake. New treatment can reverse symptoms and could lead the way to treat sleep problems of all kinds. That's next time on Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum.